My name is Jade Floyd, Vice President of Communications at the Case Foundation and the Case Impact Network. Like many of you, I've sat in moments of reflection and meditation about the state of our globe over these past few months. As a mother, as a wife, as a patron, and as a human, I've hurt for the people who have been savaged by violence in the communities they've called home. I've watched as local businesses that are dear to me shutter their doors. And like all of you, I've seen the social upheaval unfold, igniting a global call to action. In my own personal moments of darkness, I've also seen glimmers of hope, a path filled with thousands of individuals who have rose up in this time of despair and shouted from the rooftops, this will not stand. This isn't who we are as a nation. This isn't who we are as humans. A tectonic shift in the world led by women and men, black, white, and brown, young and old, from every community across the nation. A moment in our history where we've all come together, despite our differences, to communicate that we must, that we can, and that we will do better. At that same time, we've seen foundations and philanthropists answering this clarion call, recognizing the importance of mobilizing their resources and their dollars in support of social justice and equity, and for small business impacted by these historic events. Many of you are behind the scenes crafting the messages and thought leadership for your institutions that is challenging us to drive a narrative and reality that is rooted in facts and equality and social justice and dignity and fairness and for what's just plain right. For that, I commend you. And I thank you for the countless hours and the hard work that you've put in. As I take the reins of chair of the communications network this year, I do so with the lens on the changing dialogues and the sentiments of our nation and of our globe that we're witnessing at this very moment. Business as usual is no longer acceptable, not only for our institutions and the companies that we serve, but for our communities and for us as a human race. So what does this mean for each of us as communicators, as strategists and as leaders? How can we in our current professional capacity use our tools, our resources and our expertise to truly drive change in the world and stand for what is good. As communicators, we ignite good by changing the dialogues happening across media, social, and digital channels. Today, you tune in with hundreds of communicators and strategists like yourself. We hold the power to shape global dialogues, not just within the media or our internal institutions or the audiences we have, but within our homes, within our personal networks, and within our souls. So, as we navigate this new reality, this new normal we call life together. I hope that each of you find time to write your own manifesto. Reflect on what we fight for in our work and in our homes and in our communities. Together, we're a powerful force for good that I am proud to lead as board chair, and I welcome each of you to be. Now, when we say that we don't want this to be a conference, our ambition is for this to be a gathering. I think there is a distinction. I think there is a difference. When you write, when you communicate, when you use your capacity for advocacy, you are creating space for people to see themselves in other people's stories. Hey, I'm Dele, and welcome to ComNet B. Welcome, I'm Luz Wanger. Hey ComNet, Chelsea in LA. Hi, I'm Kendall. Hi, I'm Maureen, pronoun she, her. Hey ComNet, I'm Chelsea Dade with Communicate for Health Justice. Hey y'all, welcome. My name is Andre Legister. Hi, I'm Betsy Lopez Wagner. Welcome to ComNet. Hey everybody, it's Sean Gibbons. Welcome to the, uh, well, welcome to my basement, really. That's where we're at right now. And I'm grateful that all of you are here, well, not here, but with us for the next couple of days. And listen, gang, this is gonna be new. It's obviously different. Uh, we are facing so many amazing, extraordinary, crushing challenges. 
Uh, but I am grateful that you are making the time for us right now, and hopefully you'll be able to be with us over the next couple of days. My job, by the way, I'm Sean. I should probably introduce myself. Maybe you saw me in the uh, video just a second ago. I was wearing a jacket. Today, I'm not going to lie, I'm not wearing pants. Got shorts on, but a little bit different for all of us. Uh, I want to uh, just make sure that you all understand kind of what the plan is. Everything that we've got planned is available to you now on comnetworkvirtual.com. Org. That's where all the detail is. So you can explore that and you can add things to your calendar. And we get it. This is a time when if you're a parent, if you're like me, just up above, we got Zoom school going on. Uh, you are probably going to be jumping in and out of this if as, as you can. Chances are work's calling on you more, not less. So if you're not able to grab something uh, live and be with us, we understand that. And so everything's going to be available to you on demand. We'll make video recordings available. Give us, you know, 90 minutes, maybe two hours. Our goal is by the end of today, everything that's been up on the screen will be up online. So you can come back to the portal, which is what you're in now. We're calling it the portal or the control room or the lobby. Uh, and you can find that stuff later. So if you want to share that or, or watch something a little bit later that you weren't able to get to, by all means, please do that. Uh, I want to thank a few people before we get into the sessions that you clicked into, which is a couple of amazing conversations. I had the good fortune of getting to sit in with uh, Dr. Judy Monroe from the CDC Foundation and also with Kyle and Nathaniel. If you're in that room, uh, you're in for a real treat and you're not going to miss it either, frankly, because, again, you can watch them both uh, later if you wish or, or watch the other one that you're missing live. You can watch that later. Um, suffice to say, just want to thank a few folks and do a little bit of housekeeping, make sure everybody got, has what they need to get through today and, and this journey that we're all on together. So first, a couple of uh, moments of just gratitude and thanks. And the, the first thank you has to come to you. You're taking a big chance by being with us, by being part of this community. We have nearly 2,000 people with us joining online, either live or on demand. And that's by far the largest gathering we've ever hosted at the network. So last year in Texas, we know everything's bigger in Texas, and it was about 950 folks, and, and here almost 2,000. I think we ended up at about 1,980-ish. A few folks we let in late today. Um, suffice to say, we are grateful to every single one of you and so happy that you're healthy and well. And do hope that you have a sense of kind of what we're all about at the network, which is this real culture of community, and it's driven by kindness and generosity. So please make sure that you're being uh, good to one another and participating in the chat is going to be much more meaningful to you. The content that we're going to offer you, I hope, is really helpful and useful to you. We think it will be. But we're also mindful that uh, the best resource that exists out there is you and the folks who are around us. Uh, in fact, Mark Morgan, uh, our old colleague and friend, uh, observed a comment a couple of years back uh, that you can see some absolutely wonderful things when you gather with the network. But the most important thing is the people sitting next to you. Well, this year we're not sitting next to each other because of, well, you know why, but we do have each other uh, uh, available either through the chat or we're also gathering on social. So you can find each other on Twitter, Instagram, whatever your particular poison is. Uh, and the hashtags we're using there are ComNetLive, C-O-M-N-E-T, excuse me, I got that wrong. ComNetworkV, hashtag ComNetworkV or hashtag comms for good. All right, a couple of other people I just need to thank very, very quickly. You know them and you admire them as I do. Stefan Lanford, the former network board chair, he just concluded his term. Uh, he has been an incredible, uh, steady, and inspiring uh, partner and friend to me and to all of you. And so we are just incredibly grateful for his service. And we're fortunate, hopefully you've seen the news, we are welcoming a new leadership. You just saw Jade a moment ago, and she is being joined by Erica Pelletro, our new uh, Vice Chair Erica comes in from the Ford Foundation. We're also welcoming three new board members as we're gathering today. Anusha Ali Khan from Wikimedia Foundation, Virginia McMullen from the International Budget Partnership, and Daphne Moore from the Walton Family Foundation. So we're grateful for their guidance and their leadership uh, and the journey that they're going to be on with us over these next couple of years. These next couple of years are going to be well, we will see, right? We're all dealing with deep ambiguity as we look into the future. Also want to make sure that I acknowledge all of my friends and colleagues who've been playing a tremendous role in burning the candle on both ends and finding other candles beyond that. Uh, and that is the team from the network uh, HQ. And so that's Kerry Klein, who is the mastermind behind all of this. If you see stuff that you like, Kerry gets credit. Uh, Tristan Mahabir, Yab Sarah Ferris, Kareem Alston, Amrit Dillon, uh, Imani, and Tracy Mitchell have been doing an absolutely extraordinary job bringing this to you, as well as the tech crew. We're all learning as we go. Uh, we were up late into the night trying to figure this all out, but hopefully it's going to go off without a hitch. But I would ask, granted, 
you know what? This is new for us. So extend us a little bit of grace if something goes wrong. By all means, be in touch. But do know we're all doing our very, very best. And we've been working on this for months to bring this together. And we're glad we're finally all here. I also want to make sure I acknowledge all the folks who are serving as community leaders, all those folks coming in from V+. Plus. There's about 48 of you. I think there's about 365 of us that are part of this V+. Plus experience, which is really focused on not only the things we'll all be doing together in the next three days, but an extended experience over the next three months where we're going to be building community and connections in addition to learning together. We're excited about that. And of course, you're here because V is free. We hope you made a donation to a local Atlanta nonprofit since we weren't able to be with that the wonderful folks in that city today. Uh, but uh, the folks from uh, a number of organizations that you're seeing here on the screen or you will be seeing on the screen over the next couple of days, we went to them earlier this year and we said, we have this idea. We know it's important to gather. Could you help us? And an extraordinary number of folks did. And, and because of that reason, we were able to make V free. So we are incredibly grateful to all of them. Um, I want to close by uh, opening uh, our session with something that's actually going to close us out on Friday. And so uh, Joy Harjo, who is the U.S. Poet Laureate, uh, has written her latest book is called An American Sunrise. I hope you've read this or you're aware of it, but maybe not. But I think this is a nice place of departure for all of us. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read a poem that she's written called Directions to You. And if you're curious, Joy will be with us on Friday afternoon. She will close out our gathering together. Uh, this song, or excuse me, this poem, I'm a little nervous, gang. Directions to you. Follow them. Stop. Turn around. Go the other way. Left. Right. Mine. Yours. We become lost. Unsteady. Take a deep breath. Pray. You will not always be lost. You are right here in your time, in your place. North, star, guidance as we look up to the brightest white, hoping it leads you to where you want to go, hoping that it knows where you should be. We find our peace here in the white, gather our strength, our breath, and learn how to be. East, the sun rises red, Morning heat on our faces, even on the coldest morning. The sun creates life, energy, nourishment. Gather strength, pull it in, be right where you are. South, butterfly flits, spreads yellow beauty. We have come to this moment in time, step by step. We don't always listen to directions. We let the current carry us, push us force us along the path. We stumble, get up, and keep moving. West, sunsets brings darkness, brings black. We find solitude, time to take in breath and pray. Even in darkness, you can be found. Call out even in a whisper or a whimper, you will be heard. To find, to be found, to be understood, to be seen, Heard, felt, you are, breath, you are, memory, you are, touch, you are, right here. So let's begin. Hi there, I'm Matt James, and I'm delighted to be able to be here and be in conversation uh, with a very dear friend uh, and somebody who, uh, I'm not sure a board member is always supposed to tell uh, uh, the president of the organization, but has become a hero to me, uh, Judy Monroe. Uh, Judy is the head of the CDC Foundation. Uh, I am fortunate enough to be on the board of the CDC Foundation. And Judy has been doing just amazing work in the four and a half, almost five years that she has been uh, with us at the foundation. Um, really, as we've been in, a, in an incredible transformative period, uh, both because of the issues that we have been dealing with, uh, everything from ongoing problems with Ebola uh, to Zika uh, to obviously now COVID-19. Um, and uh, in addition uh, to just the many, many other public health challenges that we face at a time when budgets are 
tight, budgets are constrained, uh, but the needs uh, of public health are just absolutely great. Um, Judy will tell you a little bit more, but the CDC Foundation, uh, even though we have CDC in our title, uh, is not a government entity. We are an independent organization uh, that helps the CDC do more uh, and uh, uh, raise the resources to do that. But we do much more than that. Um, so Judy, I'm gonna kick it to you. Uh, you're heading one of the country's most important public health organizations at an incredibly interesting time to say the least. Uh, but public health wasn't always your dream necessarily when you were growing up. You and I both sort of grew up uh, uh, in what I would say is modest circumstances. Uh, I was uh, born and raised in West Virginia uh, on a place called uh, the Coal River, a little, little uh, turn in the road called River Bend because that's where the river bent. Um, and when you went to school in Kentucky, uh, you graduated from uh, medical school and uh, you wanted to serve disadvantaged people in where I grew up, uh, Appalachia. Uh, what led you to that? Yes. Uh, so Matt, first of all, thank you for all of your service as a board member. Uh, you've really been a remarkable uh, support uh, to me and to the foundation uh, during this, this critical time. Um, yeah, so I grew up with an interest in serving the underserved. Um, I think uh, as a really young child, I had, uh, I loved science. Uh, I found that I loved people. Uh, and I was uh, actually pretty, I was always the kid in class that uh, got along with everyone. Um, and so I was in uh, homes of privilege and homes of, of underprivileged, uh, you know, classmates. And I was struck by the differences. And so I think early on, I had this curiosity and, you know, why, why were there these differences? Uh, and then I read a, a, a book by Albert Schweitzer about his life. And I, I had this dream that I'd become a physician and I'd go to Africa, and, uh, maybe follow in uh, the footsteps of Albert Schweitzer, um, but then learned about uh, the needs here in the United States. Uh, you know, you don't have to leave this country to have a lot of work to be done. And there's a lot of disparities. And, and so that's how I ended up uh, going to Appalachia to practice. I learned about the National Service Corps uh, and took a commitment and practiced in a rural community health center uh, for four years. What did you see at Appalachia that helped shape the rest of your career? So I have to tell you, I mean, it, it was an incredible experience. Um, you know, one of the things early on uh, that I learned was, was the power of partnerships. When I uh, got to the practice, uh, it was very underserved. I was the only physician in, the, in this large county um, very under-resourced. And I, you know, I had women coming in with end-stage breast cancer or men coming in with really severe uh, peripheral vascular disease, mental illness. And I learned really early on that if I put the call out for help, people would answer the call. Uh, maybe it was a, a precursor to my being in philanthropy and being at the foundation, but, you know, people answered the call and we ended up getting a donated uh, mobile mammography. We had uh, a mobile vascular unit that was, was donated. Uh, we had, we were able to rally uh, resources to be able to bring in a mental health provider. And I was like, wow, this is, this goes way beyond what they taught me in medical school. Uh, and then the power of communications uh, was huge for me. Uh, this was a low literacy, low health literacy community. Um, and I learned the power of partnering with the local newspaper, the local radio, uh, newsletters, uh, uh, that media matters. And if you can get your message out, uh, I, saw, I saw some remarkable results with that. Um, the other is respect. Uh, these folks, salt of the earth people living in the in Appalachia. Uh, but you know, it, it would be heartbreaking when I'd hear them say, you're the first physician that's treated us like human beings. Um, treating them with respect uh, then led to them trusting me. Um, and that trust then led to action uh, that made all the difference. They, they, people took the medication I asked them, they would get the test, they, they would adhere to my uh, recommendations. And, um, and so it was pretty remarkable because that word started getting out that, that, you know, folks were really well managed in the county. Uh, I started having people coming for care outside of the county, <laughs> which was unheard of uh, that right. folks would come in. Um, and then, and then I'd wrap up the other power is just the, uh, the power of teams and community. Cause if you can rally a community around, uh, major issues, that's incredibly powerful. So I, I was able to to see some real change in a four-year period. 
Well, that's great. And uh, you are remarkable as a communicator, which is an important part of your job. Uh, you, you spent a lot of time, though, also in the academic community and as a public official, but you also had a stint, uh, you mentioned talking to radio and television, you had a stint as a radio expert uh, in Indiana. Tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for that. So I was, uh, uh, had moved to Indiana, I was in academia with a large hospital system, and uh, the hospital was actually approached by one of the local radio stations. Actually, the radio station had uh, statewide reach, and and they uh, approached the hospital saying um, they would like to bring on a physician and do a regular show where, where the community could just call in and ask questions. Um, and so the hospital leadership tapped me and said, Judy, we think you'd do a great job. And the next thing I knew, I had become Dr. Judy <laughs> in the state of Indiana um, and would get, you know, all kinds of questions uh, from people in the community calling in. And it was tons of fun to have those conversations on, on the radio with folks, help educate. Um, and so then that brought more attention to me as a, as a clinician and provider. And so, uh, so then when Mitch Daniels uh, became governor, uh, my name was out there. The hospital was floating my name as a potential uh, health officer. And uh, so the rest is history. I got tapped to be the state health officer and did a lot of media after that. I can imagine. So I know your mom was also influential in your life, right? Uh, yeah. And was an important figure. And she suffered from polio and depression, which you have been very open about in terms of talking about it. Tell, tell us how that impacted uh, your choices and, and growing up. Yeah, so my mother uh, was a, a polio survivor, and she was one of the lucky ones. Um, she she was left with um, some weakness in her right leg, but uh, for the most part was was functional until later in life when she developed post polio syndrome. But as a child growing up, um, I heard I heard from her all the time the stories of the the iron lungs and children dying, and then the the amazing breakthrough with the polio vaccine. And I can remember as a child lining up to get my polio vaccine and my mother, you know, it was just, it was like this wonderful day in her life that her children could, could be vaccinated against this horrific disease that had claimed so many lives and had crippled children and, and adults alike. Um, and that really piqued my interest in medicine even more. I think that probably was a real driver uh, for me uh, to, to want to do that. And then and then my mother also had uh, depression and sometimes it was, she had some pretty severe bouts. Um, I, I actually became sort of a family counselor. I was a middle child and I think I was the, the peacemaker and the, the counselor sometimes. Uh, but that also drove home for me how important not just physical health, but mental health is mm -hmm. for a rich and, and uh, productive life. Um, and so that, that was a big influencer, uh, influenced my decision to go into medicine and, and to, uh, uh, go into family medicine so that I could take care of all the needs of uh, uh, an individual family and, and later whole communities. Right, right. So let's talk about Mitch Daniels. Uh, you were, <laughs> you were uh, fortunate enough to serve with him, a remarkable public servant, a uh, good governor. Um, and uh, you did that at a time when there were uh, somewhat similar to where we are now. There was a pandemic going on and, and you had to address it. Tell us about that experience. Yeah, uh, working with uh, Governor Daniels was fantastic. Um, it was uh, really one of the highlights of my career to be tapped to be his health commissioner. And so when I became health commissioner, uh, my, honestly, my first day on the job, I was being briefed by the staff about how the nation was undergoing uh, pandemic preparedness planning um, and uh, rolling out a, a whole national uh, strategy and then an implementation plan. Uh, which was which was huge, and 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 so I learned a lot about planning. And then H one N one hit, mm -hmm. um, and uh, working with Governor Daniels, a, a story I'll tell quickly is that um, uh, you know we saw this emerging. Uh, you had Rich Besser, the acting director of CDC, on the news, starting to tell the public that we had this novel uh, influenza virus. And um, I met with the governor at seven thirty on a Monday morning in his office and briefed him on what I knew. And he looked at me and he said, you know, Judy, what I want you to do is get on a state plane, go to every media market and get in front of this. And they don't want to hear from a layman. They don't want to hear from me. They want to hear from a professional. Get in front of this, uh, line up with, uh, uh, you know, Homeland Security and the other partners. Um, and so that's what we did. And I spent a week uh, with all the state partners traveling with me 
aligning with the local leaders. And we would be, you know, shoulder to shoulder in these press events in every media market saying, here's what we know. Here's what you as the public can do. And at that time, it was, you know, cover your cough, stay home if you're sick, right? Uh, you know, that's, we just didn't have much to offer. Wash your hands. Uh, right. There was kind of those three things that we could tell people to do because we had no vaccine. Um, but that, what that did is it built trust. And it built trust, one, that as the state health officer, I was aligned with my governor. The governor was always saying, talk to Dr. Monroe, talk to the commissioner. Um, and it, it positioned me as the professional leading the charge uh, for H1N1. And it was a, it was a, a, a terrific experience. Uh, as hard as it was, it was a really good experience. And great training for what you're doing now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But Matt, we should turn some questions to you because you've had. I'm not nearly as I'm not nearly as interesting, but go ahead. Well, you've had some remarkable. You've had a remarkable career, and uh, you know, best I can tell, you've you've basically had three careers. Uh, I think you've been in, in politics, philanthropy, uh, as well as uh, communications and advocacy. I mean, how'd that come about for you? How'd you well, end up doing all three? Unlike you, Albert Schweitzer was not the person who led me into where I thought I was going. I was, uh, I was actually more influenced by George Carlin and Bill Cosby and literally thought I was going to go into uh, comedy and or acting uh, and was a theater major. Um, that's, that's what I did. Uh, but uh, realized quickly I had, as they say, a face for radio uh, and so quickly transitioned uh, into communications uh, when I was at, uh, was at school and found that I really loved that. Uh, and I grew up in a family with a, um, a mother who was a liberal Democrat and a dad who was a conservative Republican. So it was a, it was a bit like a sitcom. Uh, and politics was what we talked about all the time. Uh, so when I graduated, I thought I was heading into a career uh, in the media. Um, but uh, then had an internship uh, with Congressman Mo Udall and uh, ended up being offered a job on Capitol Hill. Uh, so I went to do that uh, and then had a great Ten-year stint on Capitol Hill, working for Mo Udall and Senator Dale Bumpers and Senator Pat Moynihan, uh, and then back to Mo as his chief of staff, and found that uh, communications uh, and policy and politics uh, were an incredible way, obviously, that you could combine into a career to try to make a difference. Um, so that was sort of the the transition uh, from you know where I thought I was going to go in life, and I always tell kids this, you know, they when they come and ask uh, for career advice. Sometimes you just have to be open to what door is opening uh, for you and be willing to step, uh, step through it. Yeah, that's so true. Um, you also did some pretty remarkable work at the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, when uh, you helped pioneer new ways of, of thinking about philanthropy and, and how it can impact social issues uh, through communications. Uh, yeah, it was an interesting time. That. It was an interesting time. I went there in 1991 and Drew Altman uh, who had been, uh, by the way, the Health and Human Services Commissioner in uh, the great state of New Jersey under Doug Governor Tom Kane. Uh, he had just come in to uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation as president. And Drew's just a remarkable guy. He uh, had uh, was gonna, wanted to figure out how you take a relatively small foundation. We had assets at that point of like $387 million, something like this, uh, and have an impact on uh, public health writ large, or uh, health policy writ large. So Medicare, Medicaid, the uninsured, all those sets of issues. Um, so he completely went about remaking the staff at Kaiser. I was uh, one of his second, uh, probably a second or third hire uh, to come in to run communications uh, because since he had been in politics, uh, he actually understood uh, the power of uh, communications and using that to try and make the change that uh, you wanna make. So at Kaiser, we kind of really started thinking differently uh, about how do you communicate? How do you use your resources to do this? Um, at that time, uh, communications and philanthropy mostly meant uh, putting on an annual report or uh, having a newsletter or a brochure. There were people like Frank Carell at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who was a mentor to me, uh, who were doing things uh, very, very differently. Um, Kaiser, what we did eventually was we morphed over from being a grant-making organization to an operating organization. Uh, They're now a public charity. And we invested deeply in educating reporters uh, and helping them to understand more about health uh, policy and how it really works. And probably the, the, the biggest, uh, uh, the thing I, I probably enjoyed the most at uh, Kaiser working with Drew 
was we had this crazy idea to uh, start um, a new service uh, that would be based out of the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, this was considered radical at the time. Uh, trying to get reporters and editors to come to work for us uh, seemed impossible. Um, had a big breakthrough when uh, uh, I managed to get Lori McGinley to leave the Wall Street Journal um, with a couple of Pulitzers under her belt and come to start what then became known as Kaiser Health News. Uh, and Kaiser Health News now, uh, uh, under uh, direction of uh, David Rousseau and uh, uh, Libby Rosenthal and, and Drew, has now become, in effect, the de facto health news service uh, that we have in the country today at a time when uh, media cutbacks are just uh, happening everywhere and the public having trusted sources of information that they can turn to uh, in times like COVID uh, are just critically important. So very interesting, and I was sort of there being able to watch uh, how philanthropy in general changed its approach on communications. Wow, wow. Well, and you know, I mean, I think what I've observed being now in philanthropy, communications is, is playing a larger issue in philanthropy all the time too. Um, what, why do you think that is? What, what are your thoughts around that? Well, I think, you know, Drew used to say, we created this great chart one time for a board meeting that basically was one of these charts where you would unfold and unfold and unfold and get bigger and bigger. And we basically had a little dot, and it was all in proportion, a little dot that showed Kaiser's assets, which were about 400 million maybe at the time. And then you went to Medicare, Medicaid, the uninsured, and all of the cost of the system. And you realized we were a rounding error. Uh, in terms of uh, impact that we were going to be able to have through traditional grant making. We use that to talk to the board uh, and say, we need to find ways that you leverage uh, your information uh, to make a difference. And one of the biggest ways you leverage information is through communications. Um, you know, being able to make sure that you are out in front of people explaining uh, what uh, these complex situations in a way that they can understand it and then they can uh, trust uh, that information. And I think philanthropy has has run with that. And right now, I would say there are many foundations across uh, the country and around the world doing absolutely remarkable work uh, in terms of communications. Vastly different, as I said, from when I joined what was originally called the Communications Network in Philanthropy. And they literally had a session on how to design a brochure. And uh, things are things are just a little bit different now. Yeah. So, so if, if uh, you could be granted three wishes mm -hmm. um, uh, for philanthropy, what, what would you want philanthropy to go deep into? What are the three things that they would really dive deep into and uh, invest more in? Well, you know I'm going to say communications. Uh, and here's, how, here's what I would do with it, though. Um, the philanthropy, uh, in many cases, is reactive, and that's great, to what's happening out in the community. But I think philanthropy needs to be a little bit more strategic about communications and be forward thinking uh, to, you know, they're full of smart people who can think, see where there are basically problems that are not being met and can find ways to fund them. So making sure that communications is on um, uh, equal uh, status uh, with programmatic um, programs, I think is is absolutely important. That's what Drew did at Kaiser, and it has made a big difference. Secondly, um, I like what a number of uh, foundation leaders are doing right now. Darren Walker at Ford, who I think is just a, a true visionary, uh, has found ways to tap into their assets at a time of great need uh, so that they can spend more now as opposed to just sitting on assets. Um, the, you know, the, this is difficult for a lot of uh, foundation boards to wrap their heads around. Uh, they see 5% in terms of spending uh, as, a, uh, uh, as, as basically a ceiling, not a floor. Um, but when you have great needs like we have right now, um, I would like to see foundations uh, spend more deeply. Um, and I guess the third thing would be try as they can to be even more in touch uh, with what local communities are experiencing. Um, you know, the, the, it's... Uh, you need, you need to be out uh, from behind sort of the, the walls of the foundation and actually out into the community to understand what the problems are so that you're making smart funding decisions. And this is not to say any of those three things, by the way, that there aren't a lot of great foundations doing this, um, but uh, I'd like to see more of it. If I could add a fourth, by the way, um, since- uh, It's so granted. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, um, the fourth is when you think about um, 
the kind of staff you have, think about their communication skills. One of the things that has been uh, tremendous at Robert Wood Johnson uh, is uh, bringing on a guy like Rich Besser, who actually is an incredible communicator. Uh, foundations have the ability to not just spend money, but also leverage the social capital of their institutions. And that comes uh, by being able to communicate what their values are, uh, what they think uh, people should be doing, what policymakers should be doing, not crossing the line, but you can still uh, be, uh, be quite bold and quite out there. And so making sure that you have um, uh, communicators, you know, at the top of these organizations, Bob Ross uh, at California Endowment, Judy Belk uh, at Wellness, um, those kind of people, I think, are, are just vitally important. And frankly, having strong communication skills uh, isn't always what foundation, external skills are not always what uh, foundations are looking for. That's very true. Yeah. Very true. So... Let's get back to the issue of the day uh, and the CDC Foundation. Um, four and a half years you've been at the foundation. You've seen it change a lot. How has the foundation itself changed and what has driven those changes? So we've been uh, really undergoing quite a transformation at the foundation. Um, it started with technology. I mean, we are in a world uh, where we need more data and, and be able to embrace uh, today's technology. And we've done that at the foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and thank goodness, because that's really served us well now during COVID and all of us working remotely. Uh, but to be able to have dashboards and look at our own data is, is just uh, incredibly uh, valuable. So we've done that. And, and along with that, we've, we've brought on staff that are digging deep into evaluation, uh, not just data analysis, but how do you evaluate? How do you start on the front end of any project and, and look to what are we driving toward? What outcomes are we driving? And what are you going, what, how are you going to evaluate that? So that's, mm -hmm. that's a big piece that we've been doing. Um, we've been doing over the last uh, four and a half years, we've been increasing our strategic planning with CDC uh, along with our, our partners. Um, and then we've had remarkable growth I mean, the foundation. Part of this is being driven by the needs of public health. Uh, there's no question. Uh, COVID obviously is, is a big driver of that. But we've uh, just to give you an example, we've gone from uh, about 200 staff in March uh, to over 800 uh, today and probably will have over a thousand staff just because we're, we've developed this nimbleness and this uh, or, or built some muscle around the ability during emergencies to ramp up quickly uh, to meet the need of our health departments or C what CDC is asking us to do. And then we'll bring that back down on the other side. We did this with the opioid crisis where we, we hired surge staff for uh, states. Um, and, and then we started to, uh, uh, actually some of those staff then were hired by health departments because they, they were so happy with the quality of staff that we were able to hire. Um, so we've, we've uh, expanded a lot over the, the last four and a half years. Right. Um, let's talk about COVID-19. Uh, so in our lifetimes, I think it's safe to say we've never really seen anything like this uh, that affects virtually all aspects um, of our lives. Um, at the CDC Foundation, uh, we have seen a remarkable growth, obviously, in people who are contributing funding uh, to the projects and the programs uh, that we're both uh, helping to operate and also identify and fund. Um, the last number I saw, by the way, was I think it was $13.7 billion has gone to COVID around the world uh, in various uh, ways, shapes, and forms. For the CDC Foundation, tell me about both the asset growth and then how you have been using that and the kinds of projects you're using to run around the country with those funds. Yeah, so the good news is for us, I mean, none of us would have wished for a pandemic, and uh, this is the biggest public health uh, crisis that, that we've really seen in 100 years. Uh, but the good news is donors really responded, um, and in particularly in March, uh, we started seeing uh, a number of donors uh, from the general public, which has been really heartwarming to see the public support to the CDC Foundation to be able to do our work as well as private sector and philanthropic support. Um, and so, so yeah, our, our uh, ability to bring funds in uh, was growing in leaps and bounds. Uh, but we also, with that comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, and we really felt that. And we uh, have been working diligently to be good stewards of those resources 
uh, to assure that they are getting out in a strategic fashion, that they are, where we sit at the foundation, and I, it's one of the things I love about the foundation is that because we work so closely with CDC and our uh, local health departments, we know where the government funding is going mm -hmm. and we can use then our philanthropic uh, donations strategically to complement that, uh, those funds. So we've been able to do a number of projects across the, the US, uh, all the way from national communications uh, strategies and messages that were really important to uh, helping um, our schools. One, one project that we just funded, actually, I'm really excited about um, is uh, where it, it's going to give CDC the capability of almost having real-time data from mm -hmm. schools. So all of us, all of us, you know, we want our schools to open safely, uh, but where are the bright spots? Which schools are doing that really well? We need that real-time data uh, or those that are faltering, we need to be able to go in and help them quickly. And so th that's a really cool project, but we've, we've supported laboratory capacity, data solutions, uh, at-risk communities, and we've uh, across the whole U.S. and tribes and territories, big cities, and it's it's been quite remarkable to be able to do that. And you've put regional directors in place, right, to be able to identify what the needs are in different regions that can then work with local philanthropy to help direct resources. That's exactly right. We've got uh, on the ground now. We've got um, Health and Human Services has divided the country into ten regions, and so mm -hmm. we have a senior advisor. Uh, for the foundation that's o overseeing uh, work uh, in the states in each region and working directly with the health departments and then their uh, uh, community-based organizations. Uh, organization. So we're working with the CBOs uh, closely on the ground um, to, and, and, and all of this is marrying the best science, the best emerging science to on the ground work. Uh, so it's been uh, quite remarkable to have that, that brain trust uh, join us. So just so everybody understands who's watching this and is not familiar with the CDC Foundation, we are funding both what the CDC uh, does not have the resources to do, uh, programs and projects that they are bringing forward that they don't have the resources for, but also projects that come to the CDC Foundation independently uh, that you then have the resources to be able to fund. That's correct. That's correct. Because we, we get requests from the health departments directly or from uh, community partners directly. Right. Let's talk a little bit about Crush COVID. So Crush COVID is a uh, uh, is a internal project that we have uh, come up with at the CDC Foundation to basically try to raise more resources uh, to be able to uh, uh, fight uh, fight COVID on the ground uh, and hopefully, as as we say, crush COVID. Um, tell us about what the pillars are of Crush COVID. Sure. So first of all, the need the need is just tremendous uh, with this, and the funding that we brought in the door, we've been getting out the door very quickly. Um, and so there's a need now for what we are calling crush COVID, and the and the three pillars are equity uh, because the the disparities what what COVID has done to uh, at risk communities is uh, is really disheartening, and we we really want to uh, approach uh, equity in a very strategic way. Um, crucial communications is mm -hmm. a pillar, um, and particularly under that one is uh, individual behaviors. And we know that we need to drive individual behaviors better, uh, wearing masks, uh, the social distancing, hand washing, not going to bars, those types of things. And then vaccines will follow uh, closely behind that. And our third pillar is supporting the frontline public health and health care workers. Uh, we'll continue, they're going to continue to need personal protective equipment and those types of supports. Uh, but they need support, like our health departments are the ones that are advising the schools. They're advising businesses in their communities how to open safely. Um, and we, we get a lot of requests from our health departments uh, regarding either personnel that they need, expertise, sometimes it's equipment. I mean, there's a number of things that, that are uh, in short supply. And health departments in many cases have been a bit under attack, right? Uh, the officials who are running them and uh, trying to communicate uh, in a way that uh, helps us do everything like get the economy started again, open our schools safely. Uh, this is something, I mean, it, it, it's not that it hasn't happened before around issues related to uh, abortion and, and other sensitive issues. There have been uh, times when public health officials have, uh, have taken a lot of heat, but this is something different, isn't it? This is very different, Matt. Uh, we've never seen this. We've never seen it at this scale. Uh, we have 
health officers, both state and local health officers that have had their lives threatened. Mm. They've had protesters come to their homes right. uh, and, and threaten their children, phone calls to their children. Um, it, it's been it's been alarming. Uh, many of them have either resigned or been asked to leave their positions, uh, particularly if they're uh, following the science. Uh, sometimes there's political pressure for them to do something uh, apart from the science. And when they stand their ground, they, they're asked to leave their positions. Um, this is, it's alarming on so many levels because we need those professionals doing their jobs well right now. They're there. And I can tell you, all they care about is protecting the public right. and, and making sure the public has all the information they need. Um, so um, the, unprecedented has been a bit of an overused word, but uh, this really right. is unprecedented. You know, I want to actually, before, uh, before we're going to come back to COVID because uh, you can spend as much time. It's just such an important topic. I want to come back to it. But there's another issue that is near and dear to both your heart and my heart uh, that I think we need to be paying attention to also. Um, you mentioned Kaiser and after 20 years at Kaiser, uh, I went off and started something called Next Generation with Tom Steyer and Jim Steyer. Uh, very different than what the Next Generation has morphed into, which is great. But at the time, we were uh, focused on two issues, uh, climate change and uh, in the deeper investments in kids and families. Um, and I will admit, this was 2011 when I went there, uh, climate was an issue I cared about, but I had no idea how bad things were and the impact it was going to have. And uh, trust me, you spent a little time hanging around Tom Steyer and uh, the people that are hanging around him, Bill McKibben and others. And all of a sudden you realize that is the issue that we just have to pay attention to almost more than any other issue. Um, I then left, as you know, and I went to the Packard Foundation as a visiting scholar uh, focused on climate and health, because as I learned about the health impacts of climate change, uh, you just saw that they were massive and uh, of course are mostly going to affect underserved populations uh, in, a, in a very, very big way, but it's gonna affect all of us. Um, tell us about where you see climate change um, as a public health issue and why we need to make sure that while we're focusing on COVID, we're not losing sight of that. Yeah, you know, actually I see climate change as, as the, the big public health issue. Um, I think anyone that has seen the, um, uh, the, the hard hit uh, communities and, and the devastation that has come from COVID, climate change is going to be multiple times worse uh, when you look at the projections, when we look at uh, food sources, right? I mean, people being, uh, you know, there's, we could be facing famine in many communities, uh, poverty, the increase in poverty. And it's just, it, it's, uh, it goes on and on the, the issues. We have a project at the CDC Foundation right now, uh, partnering with Kresge uh, Foundation, and it's working with local health departments uh, and helping health departments learn how to mitigate the impact of climate change. So from a public health standpoint, that's one angle is how do we mitigate the changes that we know are coming um, and then, uh, and then, of course, the advocacy side of this for public health uh, in terms of advocating for the right policies to, again, to try to mitigate and try to try to turn this. But the uh, uh, this is one, as they say, the horse is out of the barn. I mean, we've, yeah. we've got devastating things uh, that are looming in it. You know, all you have to look at wildfires in California with back to back storms coming through the Gulf. Um, uh, it's here. It's here. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm not sure you know this, but one of the reasons I, uh, uh, after I was at the Packard Foundation, um, I chose to go and work for GMMB, a communications firm, was I felt there was not enough big communications that was being done uh, around climate change and particularly climate and health. Um, Kresge and other foundations have done great work uh, in that area and are really paying attention to climate and health as an issue, which is wonderful. If you were uh, president of a, um, oh, say, a place-based health foundation um, anywhere in America, because there are plenty of them, there's a lot of money in place-based health foundations, what would you be thinking about uh, in trying to have an impact uh, grant-making wise um, in, in your community or in your state or your region? You know, I would, I would view it uh, a bit like um, pandemic preparedness planning, right? We need a national plan and then that plan needs an implementation plan and that implementation plan needs to be at the state level and then driven right down to that local level. Right. So as a, 
if I was place-based, I would be looking, I'd want to strategically understand the big picture and, and where the country needs to go and, and, um, and, then, and then think about um, what, how can I, how can we invest in our local community to drive the change that not only will impact locally, but will have a ripple effect, uh, right? So you, we, we all have to be thinking about, I think, our broader influence and opportunity um, and we need those bright spots. I mentioned kind of right. the school base. We need the, so every place-based uh, philanthropy has an opportunity to be an amazing bright spot if mm -hmm. they approach their work uh, strategically. Um, and I would, I would think in the context of these big issues like climate change, um, I think there's probably the lessons will come from our work that we're doing with Kresge, uh with the local health departments on that. We've got to be thinking uh, very broadly and then driving that down and, and of course, at the local level, uh, one of the things I love working in local communities and small communities is everybody, it's a, it's a lot easier to know everybody. And I think it begins with, if you look comprehensively, it, you've got to look, again, systematically, it's all the way from what are we teaching in the schools? What influence can you have with our uh, with children and, and rallying the support and activating people uh, all the way up through uh, you know the various adults? What what influence might the foundation have with the businesses in the community? Because right. we need business support for these big, big issues. Um, uh, connecting the local health department with the hospitals. I mean, we need medicine and public health working in lockstep, uh, as well as, you know, with uh, all the other sectors. So yeah. um, there's a lot they can do. Well, you and I spend time talking about this all the time that uh, um, basically there's sort of like four sectors. The public has their role that they need to play in any public health emergency. In the case of COVID, it's wearing your mask, washing your hands, social distancing, not getting, all the things that we need to do to beat this. Philanthropy knows what it can and should do in this sector and is learning as we go along, I think, and doing some incredible work. Um, obviously, government has a giant role, and we're in a challenging time now because state governments in particular, with the economic downturn, have, have really been hit hard. But let's go back to business, the business community, uh, which we don't always factor into these debates and discussions, I think, enough. What else should the business community be doing? Well, we need the business communities more than ever. I, I will say that because the, the voice of business leaders uh, is powerful. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's important that they understand the issues. That's the other thing, too. I know they're busy running their businesses. If one thing COVID has done, it's certainly been an away, you know, a wake-up call. Uh, right. For how uh, public health issues and you know uh, infectious disease, particularly, but also chronic disease, uh -huh. what an impact that has on on the workplace and the ability to have a a, a robust uh, economy. So um, I think more business leaders need to uh, be be having those conversations, whether that's at the local level with their public health uh, authorities or or at that state level. As you said, the the budgets are really being hit hit hard. Um, businesses, you know, just for COVID, I mean, businesses can be drivers. When a CEO sends out a message to all of their uh, employees, that can be quite powerful. Um, right. and, and those messages need to be consistent with CDC guidance and guidance coming from the states. So they, they have a huge communication and influence. Uh, and then the businesses have the opportunity uh, to be good, um, you know, when we think about the uh, the public support that they can give and being just good, uh, the corporate responsibility that many companies, I, I, again, I would say to them, be strategic about where they put those dollars uh, in their communities or in their states. Uh, make, make sure there's alignment so that we're moving, we're moving the big needle and not, not just doing one offs. That's the, right. that's the challenge. Right. You know, uh, when you work in the area of public health, like you and I have been doing uh, for some time now, um, it can also see, often seem overwhelming, uh, right? Because the issues are just so great. My, my father, before he passed away, had a great line when uh, he actually said this one time uh, at a family dinner. He said, Matt's going to talk about uh, his work on climate change, so everybody have two more drinks. Um, and sometimes you need to really focus, don't you, on the bright spots, uh, where we are having successes. You mentioned the schools before. Um, you know, so when you think of where there are bright spots that we should be focused on, and I've got a good bright spot for us to end on here. Um, what else do you think about and, and how important is that in communicating success uh, to, uh, to make people understand that we are moving forward on some of these issues? 
Well, you know, on a big level, one of the things that's kind of interesting that uh, COVID has done is um, I think we're on track to see uh, uh, the carbon dioxide, what, it's a decrease of about 8%, I yep. think, this year. Yep. Um, so it shows, and, you know, we've got communities around the world that are seeing this blue skies for the first time and clear water. And, um, and so there's a bright spot showing that, in fact, there can be reversal. Now, you know, no one necessarily planned it <laughs> with the pandemic, uh, but it, it shows the progress. I find bright spots in our youth. Um, I, I did a podcast last week with some high school students. It was such a delight. Um, I think the youth of today are concerned about the planet. Uh, mm -hmm. They are concerned about the, the future. Um, and I think we need to be lifting their voices and supporting them uh, in, in their efforts. I think they, can, uh, they are the leaders of tomorrow and, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. I completely agree with that. And you and I also spent a lot of time talking about our kids uh, and I'm, uh, we're very proud of where they're going. So I know that your daughter uh, is a musician, LA based now, Kelly L. And so this, this work you guys are doing is kind of a family affair. Now tell us, tell us about the song that she wrote and how that came about and, and how, how you're working on that, so using that song to advance public health. So um, I'd already, we'd already mentioned my mother and yeah. uh, my mom, despite the, uh, despite all her medical illnesses, uh, she lived a very long life and actually passed away last July. Um, and and uh, upon her passing, Kelly been writing all these original songs and working with some pretty well-known folks in LA. And, and I, I had said to her one day, Kelly, can you write a song for public health? <laughs> and she's like, mom, well, let me think about that. And, and, um, and so following, so she had written a song for public health and, and upon the, the death of my mom, I, I wanted to do something to honor my mother and kind of honor what she represented for public health uh, uh, with polio and so forth. And so uh, the foundation, uh, my family actually supported, uh, we gave a donation to the foundation to uh, have a video with the, the song Against All Odds. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, put in. It's a it's a very inspiring song. Uh, it's very timely for now. Against all odds, it's very uplifting. But it's uh, yeah, a song in uh, my mom's honor. But but we wanted to make it really in honor of everybody that gets up every day around the world uh, to 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 take on improving health and protecting health and protecting others. Um, and that's very broad based, obviously. But yeah, you know, they are working against all odds. And you know what? That's one thing I think we should reinforce. Uh, the workers at the CDC uh, are some of the most dedicated public servants I've ever seen in my life. A whole lot of these folks could be working lots of different places, making more money, not killing themselves, uh, but they are so dedicated to their public health mission um, that uh, I, I don't think people always understand what true heroes are uh, working at the CDC. You worked at the CDC. Tell me a little bit about those folks. Oh. I, I will tell you, uh, the, the scientists at CDC, you have folks at CDC that have worked there uh, 30, 40 years, um, and they, they are the most dedicated workforce I think I've ever seen. Mm. They also, they, they, you know, they don't toot their own horn. I mean, they, they're, they're humble public servants, uh, but they're very science driven, and the rigor of the science is unbelievable. I mean, you know, when, before anything is released, it has had so many checks and bounces and uh, you know challenges to assure that it's it's good science. And so they have been working. Uh, I've seen them in other instances, but during COVID, uh, they have been working around the clock. Uh, it's twenty four seven. I have a I have a standing Saturday morning call with CDC leadership. I mean, you know, it's weekends, it's nights. You can mm -hmm. contact them any any time, and they uh, uh, they they're heartbroken when things don't go well. Right. I mean, they 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 want everybody to, to live a long and healthy life. Right. Absolutely. Well, Judy, this has been a lot of fun. Yes, and I think I think we're going to uh, end this by uh, playing your daughter's song. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Enjoy the conversation. Yeah. Great to be with you. Watching the world pass you by 
that you're living in Every time you look around All that you see Is a world that has lost Love and harmony And you don't know how To heal it on your own But if we come together now We'll get water from a stone Jesus